short track cars, generally accustomed to running on much shorter speedways than this old road course. You remember last year that it was Duke Howenshell who dominated this race with an automobile that he completed only hours before the start. We'll talk to Duke in a minute. Hi, I'm Brock Yates. And on the pole today is a man from Santa Barbara, California, Doug Taylor. Doug ran fourth last year with the same automobile, but this year he's on the pole. And first of all, congratulations, Doug. Excellent performance. Thank you very much, Brock. Uh, it's a flat-out sprint. You've got one stop for sure. Uh, presuming you don't have a lot of cautions, uh, what is your exact tactic? Well, we plan to just run hard as we can all day. If the car will stand the pace, we're going to uh, hopefully make it to the winner's circle, and uh, I'm going to have my foot in it all day long. This race uh, generally has some cautions. Uh, I would expect you're going to change the left side tires at least once. Uh, will you change all four if you get a chance? Well, if we have a caution mid-race, we'll change all four tires is the plan. But uh, if, it, if it happened to go green for most of the way, well, I will change the left side. And these tires are harder this year. That's why all the times are a little slower. So we'll probably be able to make it on our right side tires. But we do have to stop for fuel mid-race. So... There'll be at least one stop. Okay. Well, good luck, Doug. Thank you very much. And now, let's go to Steve Evans, my partner, with the man who's starting on the outside of the front row. Brock, on the outside of the front row is the pretty yellow number 66 Camaro. Now, underneath all this late model sheet metal lies a 10-year-old race car that's had much success here at Riverside. Ron Esau, the 1980 winner of this race, is at the wheel today. And, Ron, you've followed this car many times. Now you get a chance to steer it. Oh, uh, yeah. I've been behind this car with Herschel McGriff driving it several times, and they... Asked me to drive it, and I figured it would be a good chance to do it. <laughs> Your crew tells me you may have qualified with a faulty fuel pump, that maybe this car is going to be a rocket. Yeah, we had a little problem. Uh, I didn't motor didn't feel like it was running that good, and I was running a Grand National, and it felt like the Grand National uh, carburetor was probably the difference, but it ended up being we had a fuel pressure problem. First lap strategy. Well, we have to try to lead the whole race, don't we? <laughs> now, that's the attitude any race driver should have. Brock? Well, thanks, Steve. And I'm sure you remember this man. He dominated this race last year in the, what looks like essentially the same car, Duke, but uh, I got a feeling uh, you made some changes. Yeah, we've uh, just about changed everything as far as the running gear goes, and the roof's been raised, and the engine's been moved forward, and it's been shortened and narrowed, and <laughs> just, just, just about everything, because the last time we had a little fad luck and wrecked it, so we had to put a new front frame clip on it as well. Well, now, last year, we remember you got in here about an hour and a half before the start, barely had a chance to practice with the car. Uh, have you got the chassis more dialed in than you did last year? You sort of chassis tuned it through the race last year. Well, this time around, we had a, a pretty good size oversight on our part as far as the clutch goes, so I ended up with only two laps in practice and got two laps qualifying, so <laughs> the most time at one time I've gotten on the cars this morning, and I got five laps in a row on it, so <laughs> we're basically in the same position. <laughs> well, it worked well last year. Let's hope that the same thing happens this year. Well, we're going to run our same program, and hopefully we can get the car into the winner's circle again. Okay, well, good luck, Duke. Thank you very much. Okay, Duke Cohen Show. Brock, on the outside of row number two is a race car so new, I'm almost afraid to lean against it for fear I might get paint on me. Randy Becker, you got to be pleased with this new car in the second row. Oh, we're really pleased. The crew worked real hard, and, and day and night, and to come out here and qualify in the second row, I'm just, I'm just really feel good, real good about it. <laughs> okay, now you got a tough guy in front of you, Ron Esau. I've known Ronnie for a lot of years, and we've raced Grand National together and stuff, and Ronnie's going to set a good pace. I think he has a lot of experience, so I want to be content to settle down, run with him a while, keep him in sight, and we'll see what happens at the end. Well, at this distance, there has to be at least one pit stop. When would you like for that to come? Oh, around 30 laps would be ideal. On a yellow flag. You betcha. Okay, good luck. Thank you very much. Well, Steve, starting on the inside of row three in the number six spot will be Jim Lee out of Vista, California. He's in a Camaro. And right beside him, Ed Ash, Gondora, California. He's a nurseryman, and he builds race engines as well. Inside of row number four, yet another Camaro. That is Bob Patch in the number 12 car. He's a salesman by profession. And alongside Patch, well, here's a name longtime NASCAR fans will remember. Ray Elder in number 77 Trans Am. He drove a lot of NASCAR machines years ago. Brock won some races, too, even down south. He sure did, Steve. One of the very best from the West Coast in the stock car ranks as the field gets underway. And if we got a treat for you today, 
Our in-car camera is being carried by Ron Esau, and he'll start on the outside of the front row. Boy, are we going to get a good view of Riverside today, Steve? Well, fans of General Motors cars will enjoy this event, Brock, because every one of these machines is either a Camaro or a Firebird, with the exception of the car number five back in the 24th position, the lonely T-Bird of Doug George. Everything else, General Motors. <laughs> 35 cars and 34 of them GM products. For the most part, Camaros and Pontiac Trans Am body machines that, as we said before, usually contest between each other on the short tracks of Southern California. But this one time, out on the big road course here at Riverside. And these are very versatile automobiles, Brock. They even race occasionally on a dirt track. There's one young lady in this race. That is Marta Leonard. She is back in the 14th position in her Chevrolet from Northern California. Very successful series here on the West Coast that NASCAR runs. And these cars, as we told you, usually are around for years and years and years. Eight or ten years old. Some of them rebodied and updated uh, by season by season. But they're very strong, very competitive automobiles, evenly matched. And uh, these guys do a super job of setting them up for a road race uh, once or twice a year. The weak link in these automobiles here at Riverside has got to be the transmission, Brock. They seldom do the amount of shifting in any event at any track they run that they'll do here. And these are just regular old four-speeds. There's nothing trick about them. They're just race prepared. Right. As we watch Ron Eso uh, lead the pack along with uh, two pole sitter uh, Doug Taylor heading around this road course, getting warmed up and getting set for the start. But before we get underway, earlier, Steve and I had a look at this course on a more detailed basis. Usually, when we cover road races, we try to recruit one of the drivers to take a camera for a lap around the track to give you that perspective. Well, we were just here at Riverside a couple of weeks ago, so Brock and I thought this morning we'd take a little different approach. I'm in the area of the course called the S's, turns three, four, and five. A very quick series of left, right, left, right. Now, they'll take this uphill, flat out in third gear. Now, you won't see a lot of passing here, but you may see a fair amount of contact and also some dirt track driving. Very easy to get off the course here, which is why they've provided such wide shoulders. At the top of the hill, they'll downshift into second gear for the most famous turn at Riverside. Brock's up there. Right, Steve. Not only is turn six the best known, but it's the most popular because the fans can practically belly up to the fence here and almost touch the race cars as they go by. Turn six is a second gear corner, as you say, a little uphill from uh, turn five down there. A hard right-hander, almost a blind hill at the crest, and the race car is up against the fence, then down a short straightaway. They'll carry second gear down through there toward turn eight, which is unique to the way the stock cars run here at Riverside. Right, Steve? Right, Brock. That short shoot connects turn six and turn eight, bypassing turn seven for the heavy stock cars. Now, turn eight is almost a horseshoe. It's about 160 degrees, and the apex of turn eight is off camber, making it very tricky. Now, the secret for the drivers here is the exit eight is to have the RPMs up. Remember, they're in second gear. They've got to be ready to bang that four-speed handle up into high for the long straightaway ahead, where they hope to accomplish the majority of their passing. Now, at the end of that straightaway lies the most feared turn at Riverside. Well, Steve, turn nine is feared with legitimate good reason because of this. This is the wall that goes all the way around this over 3,000-foot corner here at the end of the long straightaway. And remember now, a Grand National stock car has the driver's seat on the left side, which means that if you get up against the fence here, you're in extreme danger. Turn nine, very fast. You carry through here after a downshift and a hard break in third gear. And uh, the race car, if it's set up properly, will come off onto the front straightaway at about 140 miles an hour. A very dangerous and a very difficult corner here. Almost 10% of the total lap distance here. As we've seen this year in our coverage of Trans Am, Winston Cup, Formula Atlantic, and Sports 2000, no road course demands more raw courage from its drivers than Riverside. The field for our NASCAR 200 here at Riverside just now coming out of turn number nine on their second pace lap. We would expect to get a green flag from starter Don Kreger. The lights are out on the pace car. It will pull into the pits. And indeed, Brock Gates, we will have a start of this 200-kilometer event. On the pole is Doug Taylor, car number 40, and alongside him in the front row, number 66, Ron Esau. And they are side by side going into turn number one. It will be Esau on the inside, the yellow Camaro with the lead up for the S's. Well, that's the part of the racetrack you talked about earlier, Steve. What a view. Here's the where the race car works very, very hard. This S is, is extremely dangerous and very difficult for these guys. 
downshift up into turn six. And right on East House bumper is the pole sitter of the older model Camaro. That is Doug Taylor. And as you can tell by looking at that car, he's not afraid to swap a little sheet metal with you. Taylor and East South putting on a heck of a duel up front as the entire field comes to turn number six. Ron Esau hugging the inside of turn number eight. He'll make this little jog to the left, and ahead lies the almost mile-long front straightaway. Let's see who's got the most raw horsepower. Ron Esau, Doug Taylor, or possibly number seven, Randy Becker. He's a pipeline contractor back in that white Camaro. And Becker better be paying attention because just behind him, the most experienced driver in this field, Ray Elder, Carruthers, California. That is the dark car on the outside as they move into turn number nine. And here for the first time, we get a driver's eye look at turn nine. Let's see how close to the wall Ron Esau dares take this Camaro. He'll drift up towards the wall here as he enters the apex of turn number nine. Feather in that throttle. He's in third gear, as you can tell by the shifter location. And now into turn number one, and he is stretching out his lead now. Ron Esau, the number 66 Camaro. And there is the 77 car of Ray Elder, the black machine on the inside, challenging for third. But no, it is Randy Becker into turn number one first. You can bet Elder's not done with him yet. Boy, you can be sure of that, Steve. That was a daring attempt by Ray Elder, the old veteran. Now, it's a difficult place to pass, and he didn't quite make it work, but you can be sure he'll be back at Randy before this lap is over. As we watch Ronnie, so downshift to second for turn number six, that famous corner here. Up ahead lies the straight, leading down to turn eight. By the way, Steve, you know there's no turn seven on this course. There are three or four different configurations at Riverside. The stock cars use one that does not include turn seven. And that makes for better competition. You couldn't ask for much better competition than we've got right now. That yellow machine, number 66, Ron Esau, and just behind him is Doug Taylor, race car driver and vice president of a train company. And that older model Camaro is challenging down the straightaway. This is a drag race now. Who has got the most horsepower going into nine? It is Taylor. No, it's Esau. Boy, I'll tell you what, Taylor had the right line, that little jog to the left, but he couldn't make it stick, and he, as Esau just outpowered him into turn nine, here he goes through that big sweeper and holds on to the lead, but uh, Doug Taylor sure showed he's got the muscle on the straightaway to challenge. Rock, I wonder if we're going to get another challenge for that third spot from Ray Elder. Yes, we do. Elder, the black 77 car, he is just behind third place runner number seven, Randy Becker. He's hot. He's looking, but there's no place to go. <laughs> now, Randy uh, gets that uh, race car mighty wide up to the S's. Very difficult to pass uh, in here with competitive cars. As once again, Ron Esau charges up into turn number six. Watch him down, Jeff. You see the tachometer jump a little bit. Sets that car up for that right-hander at the crest of the hill and holds on to the lead. And in the fourth spot is the black 77 car, 43-year-old farmer Ray Elder. You know, Brocky is a six-time NASCAR Winston West champion and won Winston Cup races here at Riverside back in 72 and 73, if memory serves me right, uh, and then retired for a while. Yeah, that's right. He's just coming back, uh, but uh, always has fun and, and just shows so much skill here in boys on, uh, on this long Riverside racetrack. As we watch Taylor and Esau go at him, and one more time, Taylor, a little bit more speed at the end of the straight, tries Ron Esau. Can he make it stick this time? This looks like a replay of the previous lap. Esau on the inside, the 66 car, and it is Doug Taylor's going to have to settle back down and be disappointed one more time. Interesting that uh, Esau just has a little bit more speed into that corner, but uh, Taylor has the maximum speed, I would imagine, on a straightaway. And now, number 38, Duke Cohen Shell makes his move. The red and white car gets a round elder into the four spot. Now with a sight set on Randy Becker, and let's remember, the Duke has won this race the last two years in a row with that car. So uh, Duke sure knows his way around here. Although Esau still unchallenged up front. Uh, Ron Taylor tries him uh, every time on a straightaway, but it does not work. But so far, right from the starting flag, it's been Ron Esau in the lead. But I think everybody's starting to look at old Duke down. That number 38 uh, red and white uh, Camaro is starting to show some muscle. Duke Hohenschel, an automotive technician, a guy who along with the, the help of some of his friends and neighbors can build an entire race car from scratch and did indeed with the machine he's driving here today. How about this, Brock? Our top, what, four, five are really running right in a train there. Oh, Th yeah. That is Esau in front, the yellow number 66, then Doug Taylor, Randy Becker, Duke Hohenschel, and finally, the dark number 77 car will be Ray Elder. Now look at this, Steve. 
Duke makes his move and passes Randy Becker at the end of the straightaway. I think this is going to stick. Yeah, Duke Honshaw moves into the third spot. And look at this, Steve. Ron Esau has enough of the lead so that uh, Doug Taylor cannot challenge in turn number nine as he did on the previous two laps. Well, Doug Taylor is being challenged himself for his second position by Duke Hohenschel. There's the Duke moving to the inside as they come off of nine. Now settling back in behind him to go up to the S's. Let's see if he can try to do anything in here. You don't usually see a lot of passing in the S's. No, you don't. A little difficult for these wide old race cars to pass each other, especially as evenly matched as these five cars are right now. But there you see Duke in the number 38 car moving up through the S's toward turn six. There was Taylor bouncing off the curb as he headed up toward turn six, but not enough of a bobble to uh, permit uh, Duke to challenge. I'll tell you, Brock, this is NASCAR All-American Division Racing at its very best. Fine drivers and very durable, fast machines. And still in front of Esau. Now here is Taylor as they come up into turn number eight. Rod Esau in the lead in the 66 car, followed so closely by Taylor, Hohenschel, Becker, and Elder. Stay with us. We've got a real barn burner here. Back at Riverside, California for the NASCAR 200. And still the top five places, all within about 50 feet of each other. And Duke Hohenschel is now seriously challenging Doug Taylor Brock Gates for that second position. A lot of passing accomplished on this long straightaway. Here they go into turn number nine. Nope, the standings will remain the same. Esau in front of the 66 car, then Taylor, then Hohenschel. But Hohenschel, look at this move on the outside of turn nine. Right past Doug Taylor. What a pass. That car is really hooked up, Steve. I'll tell you what. You cannot go outside high on turn number nine here at Riverside unless that race car is so hooked up. And uh, that was a terrific move by uh, Duke. And I would say that uh, Ron Esau is going to have his hands full at any moment now because that number 38 car of Duke Hohenschel is, has to be as well hooked up as any car in his track. And no matter what happens down that long straightaway, when they get into the asses and up to Towards turn six. They all seem to group right back up again. The players may change, but the group remains the same. Right. Here comes Esau. Turn six. There is no chance for uh, Duke Honshaw to challenge here, but I would say if it happens, it'll happen just as it did before where Doug...